So Matt, thank you again for being a guest on my podcast, Therapy for Guys. I know this is your second time on, and I've been really eager to reconnect and, and have this conversation about uh, your journal and and maybe even your, your new substack, uh, Living into the Dark. I, I think there's so much great stuff in that. I'm just excited about having this conversation. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you for having me on again. It was, uh, it felt like the conversation we had last time, you know, on non-dual Christianity and Alan Watts, it just felt like it, it, uh, came out well, you know, it went good places. So I appreciate your interviewing style and it's good to do this with you. Yeah, absolutely. So maybe we can start with, uh, the, you know, volume one of your, of your journal. Sure. And, I guess the first question I had, and, and I, I felt a little bit embarrassed that I didn't know this precise distinction, but in your introduction, you write about the fact that it was a journal versus a diary. Mm -hmm. And and I was hoping you could just kind of shed light on that distinction and, and why you decided to do one over the other. Well, I never really made a decision. And I didn't think about the fact that I was journaling and not uh, writing a diary, but the usual distinction that's drawn is that a, a diary is just a person's record of what he or she did every day. And we've all kept a diary of some sure. kind, right? You know, dear diary, you don't have to start it with that, but that's a diary is the, uh, the, the, the private book where you write down who you spoke with, what you said, what you did, maybe some thoughts about it, but, yeah. a, jur but a journal is uh, usually defined as being something more where you're actually processing things. And I know you've read uh, some into mine. You've seen where, uh, although I do have sometimes a record of things that happened and uh, people that I spoke with and so on, it does uh, it does fulfill what I say in that introduction, where it's more like an inner autobiography. You know, there's huge stretches. The majority of it don't even really reference things in my outer life. It's more ideas that had gripped me. Uh, it's partly commonplace book. That's another distinction. A commonplace book tends to be where you put down, you record um, things from books that you have encountered or, or elsewhere, you know, it becomes your running uh, record of the, of the ideas that have entered your life that are right. interesting to you. It's part commonplace book, but it's a journal in that I'm pursuing thoughts and ideas and processing my life and interpreting things in it including what I'm reading and what I've encountered outwardly. Um, it was interesting to me to go back and read it and recognize you could go, I think sometimes a year or two or three and really without, if there weren't outside commentary, have no idea where I lived or whether I was married or what my job was or who I was interacting with. You know, it was yeah, more no, that's such a good point. My mind. Yeah. So that's the, that's, that's the distinction. I think Th that's the distinction. That's nothing. I, I feel like that's really helpful. Um, let, let, let me say too, from the beginning, you know, I have a set of questions and maybe some some threads that I wanted us to follow. But if, if you feel like there's something that I'm missing in the journal or, or there's something that you really want to highlight, please feel free to just pause me and, and you know, ask the question or take us down the path that you feel like we should go. Um, sure. You know, I don't know if I mentioned this the first time, but I, I try to treat these podcast interviews sort of like I do my own therapy with with my clients, which is more of a collaborative approach. And I kind of want to share power. And I know it's technically my podcast, but I'm, I'm really just interested in hearing from you and learning about your perspective. Appreciate that. Yeah, so I, I dig that approach. Okay, great. So I had I, I will say if you're okay with this, I want to read kind of this segment from your introduction, because I think there's a lot there. And it kind of maybe will set the trajectory for what we talk about. Um, yeah, like I said, this is in your intro and it's kind of a summation in terms of the overarching theme of, I think, the journal. And, and you write, if there is an overarching theme, it is the overwhelming intensity of my abiding compulsion to search for a spiritual and philosophical answer to the riddle of my life. As informed and abetted by a profusion of books, authors, philosophers, and sages, many of whom I only partly or sometimes flat out wrongly understood, as I appropriated them for my own unconscious ends, using them as fodder to think the thoughts, feel the feelings, and move philosophically and spiritually in the directions that I was interiorly programmed to move. I thought that was so well said, and I was just hoping mm -hmm. maybe you could talk a little bit about that overarching theme, because I think mm -hmm. it gets into kind of why you started the journal 
and maybe even why you wanted to publish it to kind of spread it out into the world. Hmm. You bet. Um, as I, I noticed that uh, that that part of the introduction, it came to me. Uh, actually, the idea for it came to me as I was transcribing all that material. You know, the first uh, that the, the the first volume is uh, covers 1993 through 2001, and there's going to be yes. a second volume that covers 2002 to um, 2022. And uh, so, as I was going through that early stuff, I had, I had forgotten most of those entries I have no memory of and it's like 130,000 words you know and that's wow. cutting and that's cutting out probably as much as I left in you know to avoid repetition and just things that are probably not of general interest it was a huge amount of material I don't remember writing most of it sure. and um it uh, as I was reading through it and uh, I noticed I was reminded as you've seen that it really is uh, a lot of it is me uh, wrestling philosophically with, or sometimes just sort of savoring and delighting in uh, ideas that I've encountered in books uh, from a variety of authors of fiction and nonfiction, philosophers, spiritual writers, historical books, horror, this, that, and the other. And I sometimes I would read uh, an entry as I was transcribing it and realize. Oh, I like the way that came out. I read it now and it sounds pretty good, but I would also notice that I probably, let's say I, I was, I was dealing with some sort of, let's say a specific philosophical theme that I was following in my reading. This is on my own. You know, I, I didn't, uh, from 92 to 96, I was out of college. I graduated from as an undergraduate. I had my bachelor's degree in 92. So this wasn't being done in any kind of situation where I was really talking with anybody. A lot of it was pre pre-internet for me too, you know? Yeah. And uh, so I'm, I'm reading it now going, I probably had no idea what I was reading. I didn't have like mm. professors who were helping me to understand it or even much conversation with anybody around me. I wasn't talking about anything uh, in there. You see, you've seen where I was dealing with a lot of uh, um, like non-dual spiritual issues and mystical yes. spirituality and other things. That was just purely books and me. And uh, mm. I had no contact with anyone. And I look at it now and go, interesting thoughts, interesting ideas that I think I was dealing with. They're interesting to me now. But in, in some places, it'd be like, I, had, I didn't understand what that book was saying at all. I see myself talking about it. And I probably could have today been in contact with someone through social media or email <laughs> that I would have been in conversation <laughs> with and had a completely different understanding of what this man or woman was saying. But maybe that's the way it was meant to be because... I, I can observe myself in those journal entries now kind of hammering out, living my way into what feels like an ownership of my own perspective. That's the overarching theme I talked about, right? The idea of yeah. trying, to, trying to understand the mystery, the riddle of my own life, that I'm here and conscious. I found my, that I sort of lived my way into it misunderstandings and all it was it was mm. like and many many times it was more me as the person reading and then feeling compelled because it was an obsession to be writing in this journal feeling compelled to deal with that in this format that sort of led me i guess where i was meant to go regardless of whether technically the way i was construing some of the things i was reading was accurate or would actually get an a or a b or a c if i were tested on it <laughs> sure you know, one of the things that came up to me when I read that passage and as I got into the journals was I, I'm, I've now become friends with, uh, there's a religious studies scholar out here at Rice, Nikki Clements. She kind of specializes on some of the religious dimensions of Michel Foucault. In some of his later years, he, he got into different aesthetic practices and, and ended up talking about something he called the technology or the technologies of the self. These various ways that we kind of form a self or for thinking about it in Jungian terms, different things that we engage in to help us in that individuation process. And I was curious if, if the journal, if writing was one of those ways that you were shaping yourself, shaping your identity, uh, building a path forward as you unfolded in your individuality. That's a good way to put it. And I think the answer is yes. As I say, uh, for a lot of that period, I really didn't have anybody that I was talking to about any of that. The only person I was talking to was myself. And I really mm -hmm. had the sense of the, of the, the uh, ideas and the people who were putting them forth, but sometimes not even the people, sometimes just sort of the disembodied ideas. 
sure. as um, as my my crowd, you know, my my living cloud of companions. And um, it's not that I didn't have a daily life, and you do see early in it, especially you see you see me talk about some daily life things, but sure. The deep issues that really obsessed me for so long, like uh, religious issues, spiritual issues, issues of identity, issues of even some societal, cultural things. I wasn't mm-hmm. really talking with anybody, with anybody about them. And uh, people around me saw me reading obsessively, but uh, it, that way of dealing with them was almost like I said, in my mind, feeling like they were my real crowd, my tribe, people would say these days. Uh, that sure. was that was formative for me. And as a writer, too, the, the thing is also that the journal is also sort of the the record of me learning how I sound, finding my own voice by absorbing the voices of bunches and bunches of other people, some of them fiction writers. But as I look back, it seems like it was much more philosophy and essay writers and so on that yeah. were shaping me and figuring out all well, these fascinate me. I didn't think about it this way, but it was kind of like when, you, when I can ask myself now, why did those things attract me? Why was I so driven? I mean, really obsessively mm. uh, to to just go to my journal and write. I guess it was squeezing out of me who I was who I was going to be. I know I kind of talk in that sometimes I talk at, at length today. I talk in paragraph form i talk in real measured terms sometimes i think that all lots of that and my basic cognitive style okay and uh, and, and expanding style of verbal expression and thought came out of processing all of that stuff along with just the native perceptions of my own life that i joined those things to and put in that journal sure so matt I, i actually wondered if you know, writing things down, journaling, was that something that was spoken about in, you know, like an early religious community? Or I I guess I was curious as as a therapist who sometimes encourages clients to write things down and and process, you know, emotional, philosophical, religious struggles in kind of the the written medium. What was there anyone that was kind of first encouraging you to do that? Or did that just emerge spontaneously as something maybe your psyche felt compelled to do sort of arose on my own. I did a little bit of it in college. Okay. And I, I do remember that uh, in my high school senior year, I was in a, a college prep English class okay. taught by Mrs. Mrs. Ellis, Joanne Ellis, who was also, she and her husband were friends of the family and their kids, just a small town. So, you know, she was a big presence in my life at more than just school. I remember that she, in this um, modern lit class had an assignment for all semester long students to keep a journal that she gave specific rules about um, on our reading and our responses to the reading. And you notice as you, as you read my published journal, I know you noticed that I had uh, throughout with some minor variations, but mostly stable over years and years, I had a, I had a standard way of, uh, listing a heading at the beginning. Yes. Notice it would be that the date format would be like today is February 17th. So the date format would be like two slash 17 slash 2023. And it wouldn't be always, I I think often, sometimes it was 23. Sometimes I would put the 2023 in there, you know, and then a gap, like I typed five spaces after it when I was typing the journal up and then it would give the day of the week, you know, and then it gives the actual time of day with an AM or a PM. So I have all of those journal entries dated with the date, day of the week and actual time. I know a lot of people do that. That's not all that uncommon, but I didn't think about the fact that I learned that from her Mm. and kept doing that. And there were, there were many years after that, that high school class that I didn't journal, but something about that hit me. Uh, and it was processing our readings. So that, so that was, maybe that stuck with me, but there was not actually a, I grew up as I think, you know, very deeply uh, Christian religious, evangelical, Protestant Christian religious. And uh, there wasn't really any such thing other than maybe some stuff that I would have read in like Sunday school materials okay, or, or, or like uh, the weekly um, youth oriented devotional magazines that I got it from my church that talked about private writing, the whole rise of the, of it, it seems like almost an industry of self-help books that are teaching you how to journal had not happened. Right. I, I started writing, I think before that, oh, I should mention, I did take a class 
in college titled The Creative Process. Ooh. And in my, uh, you know, my former blog, The Teaming Brain, that I wrote for yeah. 16 years, I just ended last year. Um, there's a, the most popular post at that, at that blog was one where I shared in detail um, my sleep paralysis experiences that contributed so much to my becoming a horror writer. And uh, I described something about that creative process class in there because the lady mm. who, who, who taught it, her name was Betty Scott at the University of Missouri. She was kind of a large presence in my life and psyche. And uh, she taught this class. She was a musician. She was a trumpet player, like really oh, advanced. Wow. But she taught this honors class titled The Creative Process, which was about what you would think. But she really brought in what would have to be labeled a lot of new age things. You know, we all drew our own mandalas. Oh, and, nice. and, and, and also without, uh, without literalizing it, kind of acting like more of a metaphorical exercise, we did sure. things like imagine what our uh, sort of archetypal spirit guide might be or something like that you know mm. i don't know if the university really knew what she was doing <laughs> in this class uh maybe they did but she there was some journaling that we that we did in there and okay. i think probably that plus mrs ellis's class when i was a senior in high school more than anything shaped the way i went about it I, th mm. then i was having to know these journals that i was keeping according to class parameters were being read by someone Sure. You know, I kind of kept that drive, but then became only my own reader. Although I had for my later journals, although I, as they say, I had the sense that it was almost like I was doing all this writing before the gaze of these thinkers and writers who were becoming so important to me. <laughs> they knew nothing sure. of me, but it felt like I was in conversation with them. Yeah, no, that I, I, I like the way that comes across that that resonates with me. Now, I, I was really hoping we would get into some of the dreams and the whole experience with sleep paralysis. But before we do that, I just want to go back to a word that you've used several times to describe maybe even what, what led to journaling or, you know, as, as you were wrestling with all these thinkers and ideas, you talk about an obsession. And I know that on the one hand, that could be coded as kind of a negative thing, maybe something pathological. I don't know that I necessarily see it that way. I'm sure there's people that would disagree. I, I tend to encourage my friends, myself, some of my clients to maybe stay close to our obsessions mm -hmm. to try to wrestle with what they say about our psyche. I, I understand how they can become very problematic and hurtful, but if maybe we looked at them in a positive way, yeah, could you speak about why you, re you were using that language of obsession? Because I'm, I'm intrigued by that. The thing about an obsession is it's one of, many things, that, uh, but it's one of the most pointed of these things that calls into uh, question, it highlights the, the point of departure, the division, maybe the liminal space, the line between what we usually, most of us in modern day Western culture, at least. And I think really throughout the world now, because the whole world is to some extent, it did become Westernized economically and culturally. Sure. This line between what we feel is this autonomous self mm. that we are with self-determination about who we are and what we're going to think. And there's this clear boundary between our subjective identity and everything else. The line between that and other stuff that actually it turns out is in our own psyche. Mm but it's not so much under voluntary autonomous control. I mean, that has been framed in a lot of ways. You're a, you're a professional counselor, you know, you're well acquainted with the terminology and the theories. You can go all Freudian. He was sure. the, the, the first to really famously uh, codify it for what became uh, modern psychoanalysis, depth psychology, psychotherapy, talk yes. about the, 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 unconscious. Ego and the unconscious and all that. Um, but obsession is clearly one of those things that it feels like it's part of you because you're, you're aware of it and it's guiding, it's coloring, not just what you do, but your thought and your mood and so on. But at the same time, it's there. It's like an objective force that's driving you. You don't have control mm -hmm. over it. And yet it's in your subjectivity. Um, I talked about creativity earlier. Uh, I have thought and written extensively over the years about 
uh, the concept of inspiration. And I've written about the, the, the demon muse or the diamond muse. Uh, you know, I wrote a, an ebook called the, A Course in Demonic Creativity, subtitled A Writer's Guide to the Inner Genius. Mm. Those, that whole idea of inspired creativity shades over into the realm of obsession with me. And when I look back at my writing a journal of the journal, it was kind of like that. The idea of the demon muse is, of course, you have a, this creative sense. Everyone's familiar with the sense of feeling driven to be creative. We think of the muse, the, the term coming from ancient Greece, right, as the idea of the, the spirit or the spirits that bring the ideas to you. You know, traditionally, they yeah. would whisper into the ear of the poet. You had a muse of history. You had a muse of poetry and so on. Um, but the demon or the daimon in the ancient Greek mode of it was another figure that was in the psyche that was sort of this autonomous type spirit in uh, the way Plato rendered it and a bunch of later writers in the mystical and Gnostic traditions was like that everybody has this accompanying spirit that comes to them from the gods mm. and it's like it's it's the thing that your your personality is housed in you don't you didn't have control over what you're interested in what you're obsessed with and so that's what the gods gave to you is this spirit that's like your blueprint you've probably yeah. read James Hillman I know that oh yeah he's one of my code. favorites yeah, he was one of the ones that uh, articulated a bunch of this for me, even though I've been thinking about it for a while. So when I talk about obsession, uh, I'm thinking about it largely in those terms, you know, um, sure. the, the idea of there was this thing that was just white hot within me. I can remember mm -hmm. just I'd, I'd be I'd be in the middle of something and it'd be like, I got to get away to my to my journal. I've got to process this. And then I spend hours and hours. You've seen how some of the entries are maybe a paragraph and there's some entries that are medium length to long essays, you know, even yeah. typed, they go across four and five and six pages. Yes. And, uh, I, I, it was like a demonic muse inspired obsession. And uh, yeah. there's, you know, when you get into demons and diamonds, there's the idea of possession to the church, the Catholic church mm. even has those categories. There's sort of obsession and oppression and possession and uh, this whole this whole area of what's in your psyche that feels like it's you, but you can tell, I guess my definition of I has to include things that are not autonomous conscious. I is very fascinating to me. Okay. And, and my, my, when I think about my writing of the journal, it was all, all wrapped up in that. Matt, I so love that and resonate with it. I guess what's coming up to me, and this is going to kind of tether it back to something you said a moment ago, when I think about the unconscious, when I think about that dimension in us that's not fully in our control, but that's definitely a part of us, whatever we call it, it's really connected to to dreams and, yep. and the dream world. And so could you maybe talk more about that, how you've understood dreams, your your period where you were having the sleep paralysis and yeah, how you kind of made sense of that and what that led to? You bet. And I can preface by saying in that in that uh, creativity class in college, yes. uh, they're one of the things that we were asked to do. And I did it religiously, you might okay. say, <laughs> was was keep a dream journal. And oh, I've done that okay. off and on over the years. It got started there in that class. So Miss Scott you. was was really influential in some ways. Mm. Uh, dreams. Um, my my most epic dreams that I remember probably are all recorded in that journal. And I, and I don't know if you may have gotten to the point yet where yeah, I, I described my first sleep paralysis experience. Actually, I had been experiencing it for a while in the one, two years after I graduated from college, but I had no word for it. It seems like everybody knows what sleep paralysis is these days. Yeah. It's gotten shot through pop culture and even yes. like the uh, paranormal activities movies, paranormal, you know, they, they have paranormal activity movies. They have, they involve some of that. It's a big in sure. the horror genre. There's, there's even horror novels about it and, if you watch Evil on CBS, which is now on Paramount Plus, the first season featured numerous sleep paralysis things mm. and a sleep paralysis demon named George. And I was watching it two or three years ago, like, good God, this is oh, just loose upon the culture now, you know? <laughs> but me, back in the early 90s, I started experiencing it. And mm. um, where, you, where you come to a consciousness or partial consciousness during sleep, but you're in that REM stage where there's a mechanism that puts a chemical out that paralyzes your body sure so you're paralyzed physically during rem and if you if that short circuits and you wake up you panic because you have no voluntary 
muscle control. You can't move, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the evolutionary idea is that maybe this is a thing in place so you don't act out your dreams. And it short circuits when you sleepwalk. Mm. But the other short circuit is if when you sleepwalk, you're, you're, it, it, it's the paralysis is gone, but you're still asleep and dreaming. Right. Sleep paralysis is where the paralysis is still there, but you wake up. <laughs> and uh, it seems like most people are a huge, I forget what the percent, it's like 30, 40, 50% of any population around the planet the, the statistics show upon studying have experienced this. A lot of people hear about it for the first time and go, wow, I have that all the time, you know, mm. but uh, I didn't know what it was and mine were pretty awful. And I had the kind that there's a certain strain of them among a large number, but still more minority uh, that uh, the people who have them with these dream type visions, but since you're awake, it's as if you've, they're happening. And so I had, demonic visitation experiences like that. And I described those in the journal. I'd, I'd been having this happen for a few weeks or months. And I remember in the, in the entry, that was one of the only entries I actually remembered writing. When yeah. I came to it, as I was transcribing, I remember that. After a few weeks or months of it, I'd said, I, or I, I just got to deal with this. So I remember I started that entry by saying, something has been happening to me and I'm not quite sure what it is. And I described how, the first major really epic version of it after a few preliminary ones was I woke up and I, I was dreaming. I was on the basement floor and my wife was beside me and uh, sleeping down there for some reason. And there's somebody standing over me. Mm. But then I woke up in our bedroom and the person was still there. Only it wasn't a person. It was this dark, totally dark humanoid shape totally black, black. They, the way I think of it is like cut out of the room. It was not, it was like a hole in the room, but it shaped like a person, totally black. Mm. And uh, I woke up into it. And so, I mean, I didn't know I was in a sleep paralysis state. Can't move. This thing is there. And I'm awash in the worst terror, nightmarish horror I've ever felt. And I remember I put a footnote in the journal to say, I remember not writing it in great detail in the journal because it still terrified me so much. It was as if wow. I had, without writing it down, the idea that it would re recall this experience or this thing, if it was real. Sure. If I wrote too much in later years, like in that blog post, I've written more about it. The thing was, had like electricity or fire all over it. And it was as if it were sucking me or my soul into it. Mm. And it was, it was like I had been dreaming and then woke up and it's still there. And my wife starts making kind of panic noises. So I think she's seeing it too. It's totally real. Turns out she was hearing me trying to make this screaming noise, but I couldn't. And so she was reacting to me. And I thought she was reacting because this thing's really there. Gotcha. And then there were other versions of that that happened over time, plus just nightmares. But then I would wake up from the nightmares sure. into a paralyzed state. So all these, all these things were my most powerful dream experiences. I know some people have vivid dreams they remember that aren't nightmares i have right. a few but mine would involve always like this thing that i can't see its face due to this total darkness or it's turned away there's one that i wrote in the in the journal where i won't go into all the details but i ended up outside a house where someone had been outside attacking the house mm. and whatever it was that was attacking the house i run around the corner of the house and uh, somehow came face to face with it it was coming around the other side but I didn't actually wow. see it because the minute I hit it, I boom, I'm shot out of the dream and I'm in the, the paralyzed state, which sometimes came with, uh, which I've learned is common. Some people describe it this way, a feeling of being electrocuted, total mm. electricity all through the body, arching up in bed, but paralyzed. Those are my main dream experiences. Yeah, man, Matt, that's fascinating. Are, are, are you familiar and are you a fan of, uh, he's actually out here in Houston at Rice as well, Jeffrey Kripal? 100%. I, I okay. edited a, an encyclopedia of the paranormal for an academic company a few years ago. And uh, uh, I was already a great fan of his, of Jeff's work. And when I contacted him, he was the primary person who helped me get in contact with the network of scholars that I commissioned to write the oh, articles. Wow. He's just yeah. great. Um, my, my little connection, I'm, I'm hoping at some point to have him on the podcast. But when I was doing my sort of in-depth psychotherapy with a, a Jungian therapist, turned out he had studied with him at Rice, my therapist had, and they were really good friends. So he had me read most of his stuff while we were in therapy. And I just, he just opened up so many windows and doors. Uh, yeah, I just think so highly of him. But 
I, I guess why he's coming up for me is you talk about the sleep paralysis is in my understanding of his work, he's he's real big on whenever we have a supernatural or anomalous experience, however we label it, there is this process, this hermeneutical process that mm -hmm. we engage in where we try to make sense of it, that that's inherent to it and, and a really important part of it. So I'm curious if you could speak to how you ended up making sense of these anomalous experiences. What was the um, framework that you were utilizing to sure. get to understand them? First, I'll say that that Pripel's work uh, is just, I love, this is brilliant to me too, you yeah. know, and, yeah. and his, his, his uh, ability to make, to bring into the academic, the world of academic respectability Yes. ideas about uh, just serious talk about the paranormal whether scientific yes. or cultural or whatever is, is amazing um for me i think i was largely helped by two things actually one was robert anton wilson okay I, I know you're probably familiar with most but many people associate him with the illuminatus trilogy that he and robert sure. shea wrote or the schrodinger's cat trilogy but he's the american counterculture writer novelist philosopher big in the counterculture movement of the 70s you know can i just say and, uh, real quick uh excuse me for interrupting you matt is my, my real introduction to him was through eric davis's book high weirdness i'm not yeah. sure if you've read that but he has a whole section on his work and i was just blown away by the whole entire book but but that section yep. on anton Wilson. so i i wouldn't say i know him well but I'm, I'm really eager to learn more about him that that book by eric is fantastic you know it oh, came from so his good. it came from his um doctoral dissertation, which he earned a, 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 a PhD in religious studies under Kripal at Rice. That's where that came yeah. from. And uh, I was, Eric ran a, a radio, uh, an, uh, I guess it was a podcast for years titled Expanding Minds. Oh, it was one years. of my favorites. I loved it. I'm so sad that it's gone. <laughs> well, yeah, me too. I was a guest on there in 2012. Oh, wow. And, uh, okay. And I, and I guess I was talking about the demon muse and creativity okay. and all that. And nice. uh, I was really shocked when that book came out, you know, the acknowledgements at the beginning, uh, I'm included among them as somebody that he said he encountered my thinking at some point and, and oh, I helped Matt, to that's incredible. shape wow. something. So that, that was, that blew me away because that book is like for you, that book's kind of talismanic. He put so much into that. Um, and the Wilson section is one of the best introductions to Robert Anton Wilson anybody could ever, could ever have. Okay. Uh, Wilson, you know, from that, he, he, Sometimes uh, his approach to reality was referred to in, in writing about it was called guerrilla ontology, yes. G U E, you know, uh, R I L L A. So he uh, he himself had had a, a bunch of anomalous experiences that are probably most famously recounted and best recounted in his book Cosmic Trigger, which mm. everybody should read. Okay. And he starts and he he had weird things happening as he was going through adult professional life as a he has, had a PhD in psychology. He was a professional writer, you know, and uh, plugged into the counterculture scene with a lot of important people in the 60s and 70s. He wrote, he edited the Playboy Forum for a while, you know, and uh, his his position that he lays out at the beginning of Cosmic Trigger, so, he, so you'll understand where he's going in this memoir type book, was uh, what he called um, model agnosticism, mm. meaning remaining absolutely agnostic about the actual truth the really realness of any model of reality. So he was, he had had weird things happen to him, like the sense that he experienced over a period of time that he was receiving telepathic communications from the star Sirius. Mm. Did that really happen? Well, he said he, rem he remembered being in a frame of mind where he thought it was, but then he could easily, easily, he had a PhD in psychology, you know, and was interested in neurobiology and all this, easily explain that in terms of just, physical neurochemical causes maybe even pathological causes or maybe just the workings of the psyche and he would not come down on any side of it total agnosticism and and, and he mm -hmm. counseled in his some of his books like exercises like his famous quarter exercise go around for so however long you know for however long it takes you to just randomly find a quarter on the ground that someone's dropped Mm. pause and deliberately one time it happens put yourself in the mindset feel what it feels like to believe you're living in a world where that, that's meaningful mm. there are there are meaningful coincidences everything is interlinked you know it's like a symbol it's like encountering a dream you've been thinking about a quarter and there it was forget all that but go back another day and like 
We're looking for another quarter next time, kind of through will, put yourself in the state of mind of someone, of someone who's a pure materialist and says, it's meaningless. This, mm. you know, it's just, it's a random chance. Um, there are no such thing as meaningful coincidences. You know, he, he really was big on thought experiments that would engage your emotions and your psyche. I think I learned from him. I read his books, uh, late high school and college, like okay. most of them. Uh, it, it somehow imprinted on me and kind of helped prepare me for this thing where I'm encountering, you know, demonic forms to be able to put them in this hyperspace and find a vein of energy in my own philosophical thinking, my own metaphysical position and my writing where I just ride the boundary of model agnosticism. It, mm. I can see how you can make a consistent claim. You could consistently argue some people would say, no, you couldn't. And I would say, check your philosophical presuppositions. You know, yeah. you can consistently argue for a supernatural or a paranormal interpretation of this. You can also consistently argue and, and make it airtight pretty much within its own boundaries for a subjective dream, physical, like I say, a neurochemical explanation of it. How are you going to argue for one over the other? Because mm. all such things proceed from axioms, assumptions, entire worldview, ground level presuppositions that are not subject to argument for anybody. Next time someone tries to convince you, if, if you find someone you're crossways to their fundamental position on things about the way reality is, try to figure out how either one of you could convince the other one. Because somewhere along the way, they're doing something where they're counting something as evidence that only is, quote, evidence because of the system that they've chosen to think about it in terms of. Mm. Same thing with you. And then what are the principles by which you argue for these things? They're all, they all seem airtight and logical to one person, but someone coming from a different frame of reference is probably consistent in their thinking, but it comes to a different conclusion. That, that leads me to my, and I'll say this more short, uh, more, more briefly. The other person who was so influential on me was uh, David Hufford. Okay. I'm not familiar with him. I don't think. He, uh, he was a cultural anthropologist, folklorist, um, uh, who wrote the first book that really sort of brought sleep paralysis back mm. to popular awareness and scholarly awareness. It's titled The Terror That Comes in the Night. Mm. It came out in the 70s, I think. And it's subtitled An Experience-Centered Study of Supernatural Assault Traditions. And he developed what he called his whole experience-centered uh, methodology sort of a philosophical methodology by conducting the study. He conducted part of it was when he was a grad student in Newfoundland and was studying the mm. old hag tradition, people being visited by the just perceived old witch-like figure when they're paralyzed and found out that there was a cultural tradition there, but older people who knew the tradition and younger people who had never heard of it wow. ha had the experience. So you can't say that the cultural story was programming somebody to experience it. It was happening on its own. So does this mean the old hag is real? What does it mean? And he expanded from there. And in his book, he uh, makes a great case. And in some papers he's written, he says, the raw data of experience is what we construct our worldviews from, you know? So taking the specific issue of if somebody who is like from Newfoundland or me or anybody that's had these, uh, say, a sleep paralysis experience, which is as subjective as it can get, it's really in your face. You can't get away from the emotional feeling of plus the sensory feeling of it, it was very real he says uh, he, he takes pains to say in strict terms in just practical terms people who from any culture or within their own individual selves who take a supernatural view of that may well be rational they're not departing from rationality mm -hmm. at any given point they are building on the raw data of what they encountered, what they experienced in their subjectivity, but they're taking a certain set of presuppositions and rules to interpret it. Mm. Doesn't mean they're not rational if they come to a supernatural conclusion. Rational at rationality, it doesn't have to do with the conclusions you reach. It has to do with the method by which you reach them. Got you. Other people are equally rational and would come to a non-supernatural and, and probably even anti-supernatural interpretation. They have, in fact. Sure. Uh, so you see what I'm getting at. Oh, yeah. Robert Anton Wilson, David Hufford, me, uh, 
I think again, that goes back to that, what I wrote in that intro to the journals about things I encountered, ideas I encountered apparently being perfectly calibrated to lead me in the direction of, of thinking the things, thinking the thoughts and feeling the feelings that I was programmed to think and feel. Yes. The, the, those kinds of books and thinkers elicited from me what I think I was probably headed toward gotcha. anyway, which was to say, I remove final interpretations and I find, mm. like I say, a vein of fascination and power in just remaining on that edge. Is it mm. real? Is it not? God, supernatural, paranormal, certainly is real as an experience and a cultural reality. Mm. And I think it's neat to see sometimes it seems objectively real. Sometimes yeah. not. And Kripal is great on that too, as you know. Yes, it's where the, yes. it's where subject it, it is it is at the line where subjectivity and objectivity meet. Yes. And that's what makes it so fascinating. Oh man. Okay, so Matt, help me with this one. You know, just trying to put all these pieces together in some ways. Um and, and I know you, both of us have some type of relationship to, you know, Christianity what's what's coming up for me that the, the question that i'm wondering as, as i think about robert anton wilson as, as i've understood him through davis's book you know he talks about this radical skepticism or, or a, a type of agnosticism that you're describing mm -hmm. how as, as an almost as a thought experiment what, what would you imagine would happen if Robert Anton Wilson walked into kind of a typical evangelical church. <laughs> is, is there a sense in which you feel that Christianity could benefit from his perspective? Perhaps. I know that's a good I mean, question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, it'd be like, what would happen for him or what would happen for them? You know, that would be the question. <laughs> yeah. so maybe both. Um, we, could, we could explore both. He, um, I think uh, there's been a way in which, in, which uh, in the past several years, 10, 20, 25 years, evangelicalism, for example, has, has been, um, it's been maturing. There, there's a lot of actual really high level savvy philosophy mm. and theology being done in evangelical circles. And it's kind of interesting. Kripal himself is well aware of that. He wrote a, a textbook on a world religions titled comparing religions that I taught from a couple of oh, times. Okay. And at one point in it, he mentions that, of course, he's not an evangelical Christian, but he notes there's very sophisticated thinking that's being done in evangelical circles. Um, some of them have embraced some form of postmodernism sometimes occasionally, mm -hmm. so they might well be able to resonate with Wilson and so, you know, in some ways, you know, postmodernism decontextualizes sure. symbols and finds what's kind of wonky and new and new patterns. But I think largely outside the really sort of what might be the, the advanced vanguard of the intelligentsia in evangelicalism. <laughs> And even in, in some cases, maybe especially within that vanguard of those who really in their theology and their philosophy in that vein, they, they, they remain very, what, I guess, what would count as very conservative and very literalistic, some of them in their understanding of their religion, uh, you would find great, great discomfort with a Wilson. Mm. They, would, they would think either he was crazy or he was evil, because here he comes saying, Sure, live inside that worldview. I mean, nobody can stop you. Right. Um, model agnosticism. I'm not going to say you're wrong. I'm going to point out that um, he liked to talk about reality tunnels. You know, he liked mm. to, he, he could point out that that's one reality tunnel, and I can point to uh, a virtually infinite number of additional ones that exist in the world around you. There are people starting from similar or the same data, drawing different conclusions. Many, many evangelicals in that church would not be able to understand what he was saying. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that they could, they would reject it because it would seem threatening. There, what, what, uh, what uh, Peter Berger, the great sociologist, might sure. call their, their cultural namas, you mm -hmm. know, their, their cultural grid of meaning would be threatened because it would be shown to be just one, what yeah. we call just one reality tunnel. And so, that's that's that kind of thing on all sides of all religious and even philosophical and political traditions is why you find it so dangerous when people are dogmatic because dogmatism right. and fundamentalism depend on there's the idea that there's only one right way to approach yeah, I was understanding thinking like, a, like, a, like an epistemological certainty 
Mm-hmm. You have to have this epistemological certainty. That's it. That, 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 that was kind of my fantasy of, of Wilson walking into a church. Could it possibly lead to greater epistemological humility? But but maybe that is just a fantasy that it's it it's well people 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 tend to feel threatened. That's the thing. You know, there, I'm sure it'd be the law of averages would say there'd be you take take a church of 100 people. There might be one or two that might be receptive somewhat. Take a church of a thousand proportionally more i don't know what the numbers actually are but but uh it, anytime any any of us have our really really core fundamental ontological and epistemological assumptions or or seeming certainties challenged in some form it is quite unsettling and evokes yes. quite a defensive reaction unless you are someone who is a, a rare individual indeed mm. no that's that's very well said wow Okay, I, I, I know I took us kind of on a, a different kind of path, but I guess coming back to your, to, your, to your journals, one of the questions I had was, and you get a little bit into it in the introduction, but I was just curious, you know, what led you to want to go ahead and just publish them? Because I could imagine some people, even though you said very clearly they weren't diaries, they weren't getting into all the details of your external life or even you know, you edited some of it out in terms of your internal life. Yeah, what, what led you to want to kind of put it out into the world for, for people to access? I blame S.T. Joshi. Okay. Uh, you know, like the, Joshi, the Lovecraft scholar. Yeah, yeah, he's, uh, you know, he's, that's, that's what he's probably most widely known for is he's Lovecraft's biographer and maybe the most widely known scholar of Lovecraft. It's an overstatement, but only partially so to say that he kind of invented the field of modern Lovecraft mm. scholarship, which may have moved in different directions now. But, um, sure. you know, he's also a, um, famous as a, an editor and an author and scholar in the fields of uh, atheism, agnosticism and skepticism. He's got a lot okay. going on in that direction. But um, ST and I have uh, worked together on various projects since the aughts. Maybe, maybe the first one was... Um, the two volume encyclopedia icons of horror and the supernatural where I wrote the entry on angels and demons and their place, both in history and folklore and in horror fiction and film. Sure. He, he edited that with a co-editor for an academic company. And then he's written for me on a couple of my academic projects. And, you know, it's weird. I was reading him in college, not in classes, but I was reading every, I had a, a self-directed Lovecraft side curriculum at the university of Missouri library all through college, reading oh, wow. every book they had. And a lot of it's involving Joshi. So then, Few years later, I'm working with him. I thought, well, this is cool because I respected his writing. Um, he uh, he edited my uh, last two books that were published by Hippocampus Press, <clears throat> the uh, To Rouse Leviathan, you know, the story collection, and then What the Demon Said, the essay yeah. collection. And um, we were talking about uh, What the Demon Said, which was just about to come out last year. And I knew I'd seen that he had. He was publishing through. He has his own micro imprint that he he's put together called Sarnath Press, okay. based on the the city of Sarnath that Lovecraft created. You know that city mm. in his dream dreamland stories. And um, he was publishing some of his own youthful journals, and we briefly talked by email. Uh, came up on that topic, and uh, I told I I said I saw you're doing that. That's interesting. And I told him, this is other story. In the early aughts, uh, I came in contact with a woman named Olivia Drescher online Mm. and she uh, had i think still has a publishing company called impasio press like the word impassion but take the n off the end devoted to fragmentary literature Mm. she was championing fragmentary literature concept i had never thought about before i love that Um, idea the idea that it is her whole idea and she has an essay or two on the impasio press site that uh, points out that, that talks about this rather eloquently saying it's high time that we recognize things like letters, diaries, journals, but even like notes, maybe even notes for a novel that was failed and never became a novel or endless mm-hmm. other examples as their own genre of literature. It's fascinating. And she published a couple of anthologies of fragmentary literature made up of journal entries and other things like the one I remember in one of them I read it was it was a guy's notes for a novel that never came together it was Mm. kind of fascinating to read uh I ended up uh some entries a handful of entries for my journal ended up being published 
in the second of those anthologies from her. And that was in, I'm going to get the year wrong. That was in 2003, four, I forget, I forget when, but I think the title was In Pieces, an anthology okay. of fragmentary writing. And uh, so I had done that. I already knew that I had a bunch of writing for, for over many years on my hands at that point it was 2002, three, four. And uh, I, um, but then I, when the, when those came out, I was really not, I'd been putting together after talking with her, I'm going to put together a manuscript of my journal entries. I don't know if it'll go anywhere and it didn't. And then when I saw just a few pieces over eight or 10 published pages published, I really felt like, huh, those really just don't seem all, all that compelling. Those entries mm. just by themselves, you know, I felt like for me anyway, but I, I don't know how anybody else would see my journal. Yeah. Uh, the whole thing builds over time and only, you know, the, the individual parts may only seem significant <laughs> within the wider whole. So that, that think about that was maybe 20 years, that was 20 years ago now. So then just last year, I'm talking with Joshi about him by email about, Hey, look, you know, you're publishing yours. That's interesting. Uh, I had some of my own journal. I kept a journal for years, had some of it published in an anthology and didn't know that I liked it, you know, never, never went past that. And he jumped on it and he said, man, I didn't know you kept a journal. He, he said, uh, I think probably a lot of your readers would be interested in that stuff. Mm. And I said, mm, you know, <laughs> and, uh, two or three emails later, it's like, okay. And so he, he said, I can publish this, this to his micro imprint. It's not a big, not big distribution. You know, it's only available on Amazon. Um, but I went, okay. And, uh, and uh, speaking of things that gain their own obsessive, demonic muse force last year for a few months last spring uh spring of 22 just man took on its life like holy crap uh every spare moment that i had and some that i stole away from things when i should have been doing something else <laughs> I, oh i know all about that <laughs> <laughs> yeah went into uh, suddenly this thing got momentum and i was kind of rediscovering all this stuff going wow i just I knew that I wrote that journal for years, but I think I forgot I actually wrote that journal for years. And uh, mm. currently with less energy, that was a big bubble last year. I think it's going to ramp up now. I'm, I'm transcribing what will be the second and final volume. Okay. And I, sometime this spring, maybe late spring. I late think spring, okay. Yeah, maybe, maybe, I don't know, late spring, early summer. But uh, it's, that was a big burst of energy. And it was, it was he, it was that conversation with him that, spark it hearkening back to my earlier brush with publishing those okay so matt i know in a second i want to kind of ask you about the transition from teeming brain to the Substack. you know is it living into the dark i, I mm -hmm. think it's i think is what it's called but mm -hmm. before i do that is is there anything else about the journals that you feel like i've missed asking you or that's just important for anyone that's listening that might be intrigued to want to check them out. Um, and, and I will say, I think if anybody has an Amazon Prime account, there's something called Kindle Unlimited. Mm -hmm. And I believe you can actually get it for free if you pay for that subscription, which is really cool. I think that's part of how I access them. I think you can, yeah. Uh, no, I think you've done a good, the, the conversation that you said, you thought maybe we got sidetracked, you know? Okay. Uh, actually, I. Uh, aside from just talking about any of the specific content of the journals, if anybody has found the types of things we've talked about and also my way of talking about them to be at all interesting, I suppose they might find the journals interesting because as I said, I think I learned how I, 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 I learned how to, how I speak by speaking to myself in that journal. I, I, people should be warned. There is a, there are whole sections, as you know, that yeah. are, really devoted to uh, me being involved in institutional Christianity over years and struggling with that. And there's a lot of Christian spiritual uh, thinking, and then it'll come out of that uh, after a while. And I cut out huge heaps of it. Okay. And then I'll go into dealing with paranormal things and mystical things and then cultural things and feeling like I'm living in a dystopia. And just anyway, I think. Sure. Well, they, you know, and I, and I don't know if you really get into this whole movement. I, I don't know that I'm identified with it, but I find that a lot of my audience, even a lot of my clients end up being a part of what's called kind of the deconstruction movement out of Christianity. So right. I thought, you know, I, I don't know if you would like this or agree with this, but but I, I, I have found you to be a resource as I do some of that. Um, I don't know exactly where mm -hmm. you've landed at this point, but 
for anyone who is listening who maybe has a complicated relationship with Christianity, I've, I've, I've found you to be a tremendous resource. Thank you. I can see that. I mean, I'm familiar with the whole Christian deconstruction. Okay. I guess you call it a movement. It's not a cohesive movement. I don't right, think. right. Um, but uh, a lot of it resonates with me. It's not It's not okay. the middle of where I am right now. But sure. in the, in many of the years when I was writing that journal, as you can tell from reading it, if that term had been around, uh, especially if sort of the distributed community yes. that is involved in that now had been around, I would have been right in the middle of that. So maybe some of what I was doing in there was Christian deconstruction before it's called Christian deconstruction. Damn, man. That, I think that's a great way to put it. Uh, that, that, that's been my sense of it. I haven't quite put it in those words, but I, I really like that. Okay. Well, that's that's a large part of it, not the whole part, but there sure. you go. So I figured sure. I figure if any, if any anybody at this point, if they're interested in it, they'll they'll seek it out. So it's titled. Yeah. What is it? It's uh, Matt. It was, it's titled Journals, Volume One, nineteen ninety three to two thousand one. Two thousand one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the next one will just be Journals, Volume Two, two thousand two to two thousand twenty two. Okay, great. So would would you mind just spending a couple moments talking about yeah the the decision to transition from Teeming Brain to living into the dark short version i was i felt moved to begin a blog chose wordpress in 2006 thought hard about a name finally came up with the teeming brain uh, because i wanted to frame it in a way that would give me the chance to think and write about whatever i wanted because i, I had just this omnivorous interest in many things yes it ended up taking on a life of its own um it was a good thing for me you know for a while, like early on, a few months, a couple, three, four months in, I published an interview with uh, Thomas Ligotti that oh, uh, that would that has gone on to kind of be one of the more popular ones that's around. You know, it was collected wow. uh, I, in, in uh, a book of interviews with him titled Born to Fear that I edited for Subterranean Press. And a lot of people talk about it. And over the years, Taming Brain thrived. 2012, I, I re-scoped it, relaunched it, brought in other people writing for me. Mm. Um, and... Uh, it dealt with lots of the stuff we're talking about here. Yes. But along with also just a pointedly apocalyptic and dystopian strain of things, feeling, interpreting current events in terms of those trends. Sure. And, um, um, but for long periods, I went dark with it. And I even would talk about it. I'd come back after months and be like, well, you know, my, my inner author, my inner thinker retreated. I went into hibernation. So mm. that's when I would be just living in the daily life that I hardly ever wrote about in the journal, you know, career <laughs> and family and so on. The quotidian. The quotidian, yes, everydayness of the everyday. And uh, and it kind of, I guess a lot of people came to associate me with that 16 years is a long time in life and on the internet. Mm. And uh, so that it's just teamingbrain.com and it's still there. I plan on leaving it up as a legacy site. Oh, but okay. Substack interested me from the time it came on because I liked the look of it. And I thought it was neat that some of the back end stuff at first I was just on a wordpress.com site and I went to wordpress.org and self-hosted. I'm not a tech guy. I uh, heard about Substack, like the way it's formatted, interesting people were writing on it and other people had other newsletters on other platforms, you know, and, and I gotcha. thought, I don't know, it feels like this rebirth thing because I haven't been doing much on the teaming brain only off and on for some years in a, found a vein of energy there. I found it just got going. I was thinking, well, what would it be called? How could it be a successor to the teaming brain? You know, and I, I wanted it to be another wide scope sure. thing. And uh, I had the idea of uh, writing into the dark had come to me from Dean Wesley Smith, popular science fiction writer who, who uh, has written a book called that and gives workshops on that. And you can find a great couple of videos with him presenting the idea of writing into the dark. That's actually YouTube. what I wanted to entitle this episode. <laughs> okay, well, you could do that if you wanted to. That's okay, thank although you. Although people, <laughs> people might find Dean Wesley Smith through that. And <laughs> the point is it's writing without an outline, which mm. uh, it's apparently actually a great many of your most well-known authors do people have the idea that, oh, the standard thing to do, because this is what's taught in writing classes and books is right. to- Conceive it, think about it for a while, grow it, write an outline, work your outline. Actually, the story, maybe putting some great ground level cultivation of the ground into it, but then writing it by living it internally as you do it is a much more common way. So is editing along the way rather than coming up with a draft and going back and editing it. A lot of writers will tell you they do that. And he's very neat, at, very good at describing that. And there's another guy named Michael Laron, who is a 
a fantasy author who did a great, great video on Smith's idea mm. uh, and put it on YouTube. And because he has some videos about writing where he sort of brought in also the philosophical, spiritual implications. He, it was neat. He was saying, you know, when you're writing into the dark, it's like mythically you're going into a cave, which is this mm. story idea or novel idea, essay idea, book idea. And uh, you don't know where you're going it's like you fight your way out. It's like a labyrinth, you know, and it, and it sort of grows you as you do it. And, and things end up much more satisfying in the end because you were kind of manifesting this book from your psyche by living it rather than codifying it ahead of time. So there's some neat stuff about writing into the dark. Sure. Don't, I was don't you think, about, Matt, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you that Go ahead. if we, if we think about, and I'm, I'm kind of channeling, um, Damn it, I forget the name, but it's one of Kripal's books. Uh, Authors of the Impossible, I think, is, is where I'm Great getting one. this idea that if we see writing almost as this metaphor for living a human life, sure, there's parts that are kind of written for us, they're out of our control. But if we do have some type of spiritual, moral agency and we're writing things through our life as we individuate, that thinking about it in terms of we don't have a established plan in a set blueprint actually resonates with the human experience. 100%. And that's what I had thought when I first discovered Smith's idea and read gotcha. his book and saw these things, I started, started thinking in terms of living into the dark. That's okay. interesting. But that was that was a couple of years ago, like right towards the beginning of COVID is when I first got onto the got onto this. And uh, so maybe three years ago. And uh, so then I was thinking about, well, I'd like to start a newsletter on Substack. I like the way mm. Substack works, uh, takes all the back end and they do it. You just write, you know, and uh, a modification, but successor to the teaming brain. And then I can't come up with the right theme name and all this. And then one day I was like, wait a minute, I've been thinking about living into the dark. Maybe I want to do a, a, a blog post or a blog series on that. Cause I think the idea of living into the dark has legs. Well, maybe that's the title of, there it is. That's the title of a new a new venture. It's kind of, so mm. your Substack newsletter can be like a blog if you want it to. So mine's kind of like a blog. I developed it. I shut down the teaming brain, put a final farewell post on there, directed people to living into the dark, used my own name as the, not living into the dark, but my name as the address for the Substack. Okay. So it's just mattcarden.substack.com and um, wrote the, actually the first three things I wrote on it lay out and progressively greater detail, the the metaphor of living into the dark, that is the guiding metaphor of the blog, the idea being, I don't, or the newsletter, I don't know where this is going to go. Mm. It's going to be like the teeming brain. It's going to be whatever is taking me there at the moment. But uh, the very idea of living into the dark is going to be one of the core recurrent <laughs> themes and all the implications of that in life and creativity and society and philosophy. Just like you said, it's, we live into the dark. If you if you if you think otherwise, I think you were creating a comfortable seeming illusion for yourself. Yeah. Man, Matt, one of the things that I think really resonates with me about that and just you as I experience you as a person is you seem throughout your life to kind of follow the inner energy. I know that sounds kind of a weird statement, but when I was working through some of this with my therapist, we talked about the the daemon or the muse or wh whatever we call it as almost this energy that you can't quite control, but you have to be in touch with and then you follow in terms of creativity and how you live your life. And I see that in my own podcast venture, I'll, I'll get obsessed with a certain idea or you know, group of people. And then I just get so energized that other interests just kind of fall away. And I just get obsessed with this one thing. Yep. And I don't know that I'm necessarily choosing it. I'm just trying to follow, yeah, that that inner yeah. sense of things. You ride the wave, right? You ride the you ride the wave. And that's, that's I think, all creative people, not only all creative people, everybody in general, but people mm. that sort of consciously self-identify as or recognize the feeling of creativity, maybe feel it more consciously, more potently. Sure. Um, you know, life is a series. It seems like it's a series of themes and situations that, constellate or maybe even sometimes coagulate if it doesn't feel too good around <laughs> you and then they then they go away you know and that's also internally right sure. and, and sometimes we have a disjunction between where we think where we feel we are and that energy and what's around us sometimes it's aligned um but however it works we're not in control of why we're interested mm. in what we're interested in or what these 
waves of energy are. And that was my whole point when I wrote the book, A Course in Demonic Creativity, which started okay. as another blog that I ran from 20, 2009 to 2011 titled okay. just Demon Muse. It's gone now. If you okay. go to demonmuse.com, I think you'll find some, some Japanese, I can't tell what now has okay. as the, as the domain. But I took the articles that I was writing there about they were creativity lessons and advice and turned them into that ebook, A Course in Demonic Creativity. And the whole thing, the whole thing is about um, the value as a writer, but it's applicable to other, to everything else. Sure. Of consciously owning, recognizing that sense that your own creativity is like this autonomous force. Mm. It's like this autonomous intelligence that, that uh, has its own schedule, it has its own preferences and its own desires and you're linked inextricably in this interrelationship but that you can uh, you can work with it more or less wholesomely effectively and that and i was the whole book is devoted to laying out the idea i go into some of the history of the ancient greek and roman concepts and even part partially in terms of uh, um, like uh, some of the occult and esoteric versions of it like the holy guardian angel you know from western sure. esoteric magical traditions um and then offers chapters full of advice about getting to know your own demon muse and uh, maybe figuring out its preferences and its rhythm and, and what it wants to write about but the, the, the whole thing is predicated on the idea which i bring out explicitly that just the choice to view it this way and to relate to it this way and to think of it as an it that you can relate to rather than mm. just being you is really helpful. It's kind of funny. I already had this going on. And then Elizabeth Gilbert, you know, who wrote Eat, Pray, Love. Yeah. And Big Magic. Uh, Big Magic. Yeah. Yeah. She gave that, uh, that TED talk on yeah. creativity and the, she was, she was referring to the ancient Roman concept of the genius. Same thing. Same. I'm already all, I'm already all over this and she comes out with it, which is one Damn of those <laughs> synchronistic things that happened all the time, you know, but it was good. And I refer to her in the book and she, that's okay. that, that TED talk yeah, is, that was a great is just a it's justifiably well known and she put those ideas into big magic so it's interesting to see this as it was kind of like it, it it conforms to what she and i and others are talking about it's as if there are cultural ideas that the time comes and you find it encroaching and making incursions from various apparently separate points well mm -hmm. just like was it leibniz and uh, newton invented calculus independently it was time for calculus to happen mm -hmm. in history right the differential calculus it's, it seems like the past 12, 15 years, it's like sort of time in some way for ideas about this force, call it the muse or the demon or whatever, uh, to make inroads. And it really seems like a lot of people respond to it. That's another thing is people who find it interesting. And there's a lot of them, they're fascinated, could have fallen on deaf ears, but I think there's something that people in both intellectual and creative circles find electrifying about this thing i know sure. i do and and that and so uh, that's part of living into the dark i think is being that all goes together that's being in tune with that thing that is leading you you don't know where you're on this journey together but it unfolds and so for since sure. september since september the living into the dark newsletter has i've given it its head there's there has to be a bit of a structure to get things done but energy waxes wanes directions change yeah wow Okay, Matt, this has been a phenomenal conversation. I've, I've gotten so much out of it. Is there anything else that you feel like you'd want to share about the book, yourself, your project before we sign off? Uh, I appreciate the question, but no, I mean, I've been speaking pretty personally through a lot of this anyway. I feel like we've, we've conversationed into the dark <laughs> in, in the way it's wanted to go. So I appreciate, I appreciate your having me on again to talk about these things. Absolutely. Anytime. Well, would you mind uh, just ending with the line of the podcast, which is continue the conversation, which I hope that we it? do. Yeah. Okay. Would you mind saying it? Well, how about, how about I just say, continue the conversation. Awesome. Thank you so much.